Good afternoon and welcome back to the Sustainable Manufacturing Conference on IMTS Spark. With this Sustainable Manufacturing Series, we're examining uh, sustainable issues from a variety of aspects, whether it's solids or air quality, waste removal, coolant removal. How do those things affect air quality inside and outside the plant? How do they affect your ability to retain employees? How do they affect your bottom line? Um, today, our guest is Jack Burley from Big Kaiser Precision Tooling. Uh, many of you know Jack. He has been around for, I guess, nearly 30 years now at Big Kaiser. And uh, if you follow LinkedIn, you know that he is scheduled to become president of the company in January, which is very well earned. Jack is a U.S. Marine veteran. He has his degree in mechanical engineering from State University of New York, and his ability to be not only on the engineering team, but on the sales team, on the project management team, gives him a very wide perspective of the issues for our industry. So he's an excellent guest for our program here today. And with, Jack, with that, Jack, I'd like to not waste any more time and turn it over to you. We'll come back at the end for Q&A. Hey, good morning or good afternoon, sorry. Um, Thank you for that kind introduction, Bill, and uh, appreciate getting the opportunity to uh, talk this morning or this afternoon. Uh, we're right at the lunchtime for those uh, listening. And and when we were presented with this topic, uh, we, we were a little bit uh, scratch our heads. What? How do we? How do we do this? But I think uh, when we look at all companies, there's something that we can all do to do our part in sustainable manufacturing. And what I would like to talk about today is how we as companies and how we consume some of our precious materials, specifically tungsten carbide, uh, we, have, we have to really be careful about that. And um, you know, we're not a company that manufactures carbide. We don't uh, have uh, scrap uh, programs or anything like that. But what we want to talk about as a company is the economy of quality and, and what that really means as far as what the sustainable manufacturing is. And the economy of quality basically is our position that we can do our environment a lot of good if we can ensure that we are consuming all of the material completely. And we're, we're not leaving parts of the carbide left untouched or, or we're not using it to its full advantage. And, and with that, you know, the economy of quality, some people might think that, well, if you're, you're buying less expensive tools, you're going to have a higher economy, you know, you're, you're going to spend less. Um, we're, we're actually the opposite. We feel that sometimes to, to make money, you got to spend a little bit of money. And, and with that comes higher performance tools, higher precision tooling. And, and in the end, uh, what we try to prove to people is that although it costs a little bit more in the beginning, uh, over time, the payback, the ROI is going to be there uh, and, and then some. And the ROI in our case is how many cutting tools the shops are going to go through. So that, that's a bit of the outline of where we're going to is to how to justify higher or premium tooling and how that relates back to sustainable manufacturing as far as how much of the raw materials and carbide that we're consuming from day to day in the shop. And of course, as we know, if we have lower quality tooling, we're probably going to consume more. And, and over time, we're going to spend more on, on our carbide, although we saved a lot of money on, on the steel. And there's some um, other advantages, but um, I want to just stay close to that one. Um, one, of, one of the things that we do want to look at, of course, is, is carbide as a raw material. And, and how can we preserve and conserve what is a precious commodity out there. Uh, one, one of the things that I was able to find is that there is actually one mine now operating in the United States, uh, in Utah, and that's a picture on the left there, uh, that they did open up to make tungsten. It is not an easy material to mine though. And um, it does require, when we talk about sustainable uh, and green and things like that, a lot of earth has to be moved to get to just one uh, pound of, of tungsten. You have to really remove a lot of earth, like one ton of it. And it's in rocks. And then it takes a lot of equipment to do that. 
But the other side of that is, of course, you know, some of the, the availability. And uh, when we look at where you can get it as a raw material, China still holds 75% of all the available mines that, that you can get uh, the raw material tungsten carbide. And as we know, tungsten is one of the precious materials, not just for cutting tools. It's a raw material used in lighting. Uh, it's used in computers and other various uh products. So we are not the only source of, of consumer in the world, but we are one of the major sources of consumer because it has a high heat resistance and it's a, it's a great product to use when we're cutting steels and even uh, non-ferrous materials like aluminum. But also it's very indis indispensable when we're looking at uh, cutting some of the nickel alloys. And on the right side, uh, I showed a picture of what hopefully most companies are doing that we're trying to take our used scrap carbide and we're recycling it and, and this is a great way just like recycling cans and bottles to put the the raw materials back into the system and let the the carbide manufacturers reprocess it, it it's uh it doesn't matter from whose carbide you put into the box it's as long as it's a it's a tungsten carbide piece coated uncoated throw it in the box and, and let the the scrap carbide recyclers take it, they'll pay you. Uh, I'm not sure what the cost is right now, but if you don't have a scrap carbide program, of course, you know, for, for sustainable manufacturing, we, we certainly recommend that you get one as soon as possible. Now, how does this uh, equate to Big Kaiser? Big Kaiser makes uh, precision tool holders, uh, specifically collet chucks, hydraulic chucks, milling chucks, mostly to go on your milling machines for um, holding drills, end mills, ramers, basically anything that's round that's going to be made out of carbide. It could be made out of high-speed steel, but it's generally your high-consumption consumables, such as the drills. And we live by a, a small rule, like we, we tell people, is, you know, use the one-tenth equals 10% rule. And what we mean by that is for every 10 10 thousandths of an inch of runout, you increase or decrease your tool life. And we did a survey about, uh, it's been more than 10 years ago, and we asked uh, most customers, what do you think your average runout is and what should it be? And most of the customers came back and thought around half a thousandths, five tenths. If you're, you're running five tenths or better, you probably got about as good a, a runout as you're going to get. Well, the reality is um, that's still leaving a lot of your tool unused. Uh, five tenths is actually not as good as it needs to be, especially as tools get smaller. Uh, under half inch, uh, five tenths is, is actually much uh, to the uh, not to the benefit of, of higher precision. It's uh, you, you're looking at trying to get down to two tenths or, or even a tenth of run out. And the way that we've been able to prove that is we made our own drilling test. And uh, we, we strict, strictly did this with three different materials just to prove the point. But as you see on the left here, there's a, a red line which shows carbide. And on the bottom axis is the total indicated front out. We were able to make uh, repeated tests with 80 millions, two tenths, four tenths, and six tenths run out on about an eighth inch diameter drill. Drilling piece of steel, it's a common size tool, a lot of people using, uh, of course, the data uh, could be different if it was a 3 h drill and, and other things like coolant and whatnot, but we used all practical uh, variables to, to use the best possible tool life we could get and strictly change just the run out. And on the vertical axis, the number of drilled holes uh, as you can see, the, the lines start to, to quickly degrade as you go to the right. So at 80 millionths, or just under one ten ten thousandths of an inch of TIR, total indicated rating, at the margins of the drill, we're able to get over 145, almost 150 drilled holes before we see about um, four thousandths of wear land at which point we decided that, that the drill was no longer uh, usable. And as you can see, if you double that, two tenths, you're already, as we said, a tenth equals 10%. You're already reduced by about 10, 15% of your usable life. And you keep spreading that down to six tenths. Again, going towards about what people think would be average, a pretty good run out 
um, you can see that you've lost more than half of the actual tool life of that drill. And it, it doesn't sound like um, that, that's a lot, you know, an eighth inch drill probably doesn't cost that much, but um, if, if everybody's only using half of it, we're, we're doubling the amount of drills that are consumed every year. Uh, just simply by putting a little bit better quality tool holder behind it, we can reduce the, the time that we have to replace it. And uh, I think this is a, a very valuable part of who we are is um, how we can reduce our carbon footprint by reducing the, the amount of drills and reamers and end mills that we consume through our customers. And as we uh, look at this uh, from an economic point of view, um, obviously the, the, letter, the, the less number of drills that we have to replace uh, based on the same number of holes, uh, we like to, to qualify that is how much does the hole cost to drill, not how much does the drill and the tool holder cost to drill the hole. Because at the end of the day, we want to know how many holes we can drill uh, per each tool. And uh, as we can see, with an 80 millionths TIR and a 6 tenths TIR, there's considerable savings uh, on what the, the tool consumption is going to be over time. And uh, we, we have various tool holders that we can use to hold drills, um, some with coolant, some with through spindle coolant, some uh, with collets, some with hydraulic chucks. There's a multitude of different ways that we can do that. And, and they may change this variable a little bit. We didn't go to the point of checking what would happen with a, a collet chuck with six tenths run out versus a shrink fit chuck or a, a, uh, a regular hydraulic chuck, any of those things to see if that would make a difference. At the end of the day, um, we've done similar comparison tests and if the run out is truly very, very good, like under a tenth or two tenths, then the total life was actually much better. So, you know, if you were looking at overall uh, in your shop, take, take your monthly check that you write to your normal industrial distributor for what you're paying in carbide tools. And, and it's, a, it's probably a fairly large number because it's got a lot of different parts and products in there. But imagine if you can that, if we went with a little bit better tool holder that perhaps uh, we could see that check go down because we're not consuming nearly as many drills and not as many end mills as we typically do. So that that's a bit of who we are as a company on, on making green. We do other things uh, internally and as a company, but uh, as far as what we do to help the consumers and the market is to provide with the best possible tool holding systems that you can. Now, one of the other things that a lot of shops will ask me is that, well, you know, it's great you got perfect running tool holders, uh, but what if my spindle is not as good as it needs to be? Well, that, that's a problem. And the tool holder can't necessarily fix that. Um, that's something that probably has to be fixed if it's running out quite a bit. But we also make tools um, that can change the runout. Uh, so going back to our test, one of the ways that we did that is we used a, a tool which changes the amount of runout in, in the tool holder itself. Now, typically we do that in a way that we're trying to reduce the runout, of course, to zero at the margin. Uh, but to, for the practical purposes of these tests, we were able to use that tool holder to actually increase the runout so that we could have defined variable of how much that runout is. So. If you've got a bad spindle and you're looking to improve that, of course, especially with reamers, there are tool holders that exist uh, for total run uh, availability or, or accuracy that you can dial that in. Um, it's something you have to do in the spindle and you have to put uh, the tool into the machine and you have to dial it in, but you can get it effectively down to zero. So that's a, a little bit uh, of where we're at. And um, I would like to, to spend a little time and introduce Tim Wetzel from Homeyer. Uh, he's the president of Homeyer Precision Manufacturing. And uh, Tim has uh, graciously agreed, and I, I really appreciate to uh, come on this morning and talk a little bit about how 
this has been something that the Holmeyers uh, and, and his shop have taken advantage of some of what we've done. Jim, uh, I hope you're on and I'd like to, to talk to you a few minutes if you have uh, some more time. Sure, thank you for having me today. Hey, Tim, um, you know, we, we've got a little history. Uh, I know that uh, we introduced our products uh, several years ago to your shop, but uh, can you give us a little background? I, I think this was maybe a shop initiative of not just us, but you know, what were you trying to achieve as a company when you were looking at um, changing the, the culture of your shop and how you're using tools and machines? Well, we started off, uh, went to uh, drive, uh, teams and uh, the changing of the culture out in the shop. You know, we went from a, a single owner company to a, a team managed company and we wanted to reflect that out in the shop. At the same time, we also wanted to create a real high quality product and standardize that high quality product through our tooling machines, uh, just about everything in the shop. And, uh, you know, initially uh, it's, it's a little difficult to overcome because the cost is uh, a little bit higher than normal. But what we found was when we did the standardization of tool holders, cutting tools, machines, coolant, we saw uh, a drastic uh, decrease in costs on those areas. Even though they cost more compared to other shops or other mm -hmm. products, they drove the cost down. And that's a, a system that we put in place is standardization. That system's worked really well for us. So that probably took a little bit of time to get some of the people in the shop, you know, that, that's a company culture thing. You know, we've always done it this way. Probably the, the worst words anybody can ever say is it's always worked. So why change? Was it, was it really difficult to start getting some of the attitudes to change on spending differently than you had in the past? Yeah, we're a 30 year old company. So sometimes you have 30 year old habits that are sometimes difficult to break. And, uh, as we move forward, there's, uh, I would kind of say, if you're on the bus and you make sure you got the people on the right seat of the bus and there's people that really didn't want to make the change. Some of those people left uh, on their own and some, you know, we had to hire different types of people to fill those places. And we always were very diligent about buying, hiring the proper people that also saw it the same way we did. And uh, that's very important. And it, it, it's, it's an ever going process. I mean, I don't know that we say that we've got anything nailed down. We're still doing it. I mean, we're, we continue to do this every single day. We're uh, a lot further on than we were five years ago. And I'm very pleased where we're at, uh, but there's more things to be done. And uh, there's always something we can squeeze out of it. And that's what we're trying to do. Has uh, some of the guys in your shop seen any other benefits to using the higher precision tools uh, besides the, the ROI on tool life? Well, they've seen a lot accurate holes, repeatability is definitely there. And uh, yeah, they see a longevity in the tool life of their tools, uh, the accuracy of their tools, uh, boring bars and uh, different things like that. Uh, yeah, the repeatability is great. Now, we outfit every one of our new machines uh, that we purchase, we, we buy big Kaiser holders and we standardize all our tooling and we standardize our coolant. That's all on purpose. And for that specific reason, we have to have a good part coming off the machine right off the bat. So the standardization process, um, is that something that you're looking to change or update in the future? Or when do you decide that, okay, we've done this now for five years or three years, you know, when do you start saying maybe there's something else out there we should keep looking? Well, I think that it's an evolution that happens in a way. I mean, it just, it, there's more things that we want to do. I mean, it, it could be your tool library, you know, the life of that and how you set the tools up in the machine and you have them all preset, whatever that might be. Um, and I'm sure there's always going to be new technology out there that you want to look at. That's why these things are important that we're doing today is to have that conversation. But uh, yeah, it's, 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 we're always looking for that. Whether or not we have the answer, I don't know, but um you know, we continually work towards that effort for sure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm getting off a little bit here maybe, but um, where, where do your um, your programmers or your, your shop guys, where do they find their information? How do they, how does Holmeyer provide them with tools to say, okay, go out and start looking at some stuff or do you just make it an open, do it whatever you got time or don't mess with it at all? 
Well, we rely on the companies that we do business. We rely on their staff for their their expertise. So, like if you know we have a tool supplier come in, we 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 talk to them about what you know the the type of machining processes that we're looking to do, and you know we we trust that we earn that. And same thing with a big Kaiser representative. We try to learn from them the best aspects of doing that. So. One, we learn from their representations of the company. Two, uh, we do a lot of Google search, you're looking at modern machine shop. You look at IMTS shows. You look at things that we're providing now, especially through the COVID. And those guys have access to some of that. And if we see something come across our desk, we'll forward it to the appropriate people to take a look at that webinar or whatever. But uh, we're trying to be very forward and open-minded when it comes to looking at opportunities and things that we can do to get better. Um, so it's, uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, it, it does because, you know, we, we, we sometimes hear from, from our point of view that, uh, you know, a lot of the shops don't get access or don't provide access uh, to the people using the tools to any outside sources. They just, you know, hand tools over to them and say, make them work. And right. I'm just wondering if your company has a little bit different uh, attitude well, about it. Yeah, because I mean, it's not one one person isn't always the smartest person. I mean, if you have uh, a group of people looking at the same situation and you can collectively come up with an idea or a decision, I think it works out great that way. And you never know when somebody that's on a shop floor says, hey, I, what about this? And well, we never thought about that, let's try it. So yeah, we want to take a, take a look at all that. Okay. Um, I, I didn't really, uh, want to try to get into any specifics with you about, you know, carbide consumption or anything like that. Um, but did Homeyer have any way to track, as I suggested, how much they're paying for consumables then versus now, or was that just well, kind of a let, let the guy write the check and don't worry about it. Well, we knew, we knew it was the, initially the cost was going to be a little difficult to overcome initially, but we knew the payoff down the road was once we start standardizing the machines, the coolant, the tools, the tool holders, we knew that we were gonna get the payback. And right now with the consumables and things like that, we're, we're running like 20, 25% cost savings what we were two, three, four years ago. Um, we're reducing the amount of cutters we're using almost like 30% just because of the quality of the holders and machines and things that we're using. So it's, it's all connective, it all works together. And if you spend a little bit more money and you get more accuracy, it pays off. Well, we, we appreciate your business, Tim, and uh, I hope that the economy of quality has been uh, fruitful for the Homeyer company. I think it has. We, we look forward to doing more business with you. Uh, Absolutely. And the needs change. Um, so, Bill, uh, if there are any uh, uh, messages or questions out there, we'll be happy for either Tim or myself to answer them. Yeah, we did. There was a couple that came in right at the beginning when you were talking about the recycling. And, and I know that, that this series in particular focuses more on the sustainability aspect of it. But the questions I, I was seeing, um, does your company, Jack, does BK have a specific recycling program for people or companies like the Homeyer Group? Do you have something where BK takes the lead in helping companies recycle? Uh, as we are not a carbide manufacturer, so we do not do scrap uh, tungsten. Um, mm -hmm. We uh, are only providing uh, the tooling to go uh, for the tools to be held with. Uh, so we don't have a, a scrap program per se, but most of the major carbide producers mm -hmm. uh, do have some sort of a system. Uh, I would only make sure that if you if you're evaluating a scrap company right now, get some quotes because uh, you don't want to get low ball. That, that carbide's worth some money. Um, you want to get the best value for what it is and, and don't let the, the, the shop guys keep throwing uh, inserts back in their, in their drawers. You know, I've, I've heard of a lot of places that have been starting to get pretty lean. They've let some people go and all of a sudden they got all this influx of carbide because it's like the tool crib or the, the, dual chests were full of them. And it's like, wow, all these unused inserts just sitting here because uh, they just didn't know what to do with them. I don't know, Tim, do you guys have a scrap program that you use? Yes, we do. And we don't have, the guys don't keep their tools in, the, in the, their carts anymore. Everything's accessible. It's all managed. You zap it with a 
barcode and you pull out your tool, we know who's taking the tools. We know that they have to put them back for whether they're being uh, reground or whatever. But yes, we uh, our guys don't put them. In. We used to have that was one of our struggles was getting them out of their out of their cart and out of their toolboxes. We don't have that anymore. It's it's that they they're readily available. They know it. They need it. And again, it's we reduce tooling costs. It's amazing. It's crazy, but it works. That that's another point, Bill. Um, we find a lot of times that uh, customers index inserts are changing way too quickly. Um, you know, the, the slightest glitch in the operator's right there. He's trying to index. He thinks it, but we we found we've done a lot of testing, and you know where you think you know when the band starts showing that it's starting to lose size, it, it's probably still got a lot more life left to it. But um, probably throwing away tools that aren't ready to be thrown away is is big waste. And one of the ways that shops, I think, get better at that, here's what our company does in Switzerland. Uh, when a tool comes off the machine, just as Tim had suggested, we know the life left on that tool. We don't want to just take it off because the job's done and there might still be 30 hours of tool time left on it. Throw it away until the job comes back. It actually gets scanned into the tool room with the amount of hours left on that tool, the cutting tool itself. So when they pull it back up, they know exactly how much they should expect out of it. So it's, a, it's a little more sophisticated, but it does pay a lot in the, in the backward. And can you can you help your customers with the the mathiness of all that, Jack? Is that something that you're prepared to do? Our, our company does offer through our tool management software systems, the ability to, uh, through our presetting systems, uh, check and track all your tool life and libraries and data. Yes, we can work with various companies to get that set up. Yes. Okay. Now you, you talked, uh, I don't know if we, we got into it on today's session, but in our previous conversations, Jack, you talk about everybody doing their small part towards sustainability, that there's not one giant score. I, am I summarizing that correctly? Yeah, I, I think that's perfect. You know, we're all in this together. We're all sitting on the same planet and uh, there's only so much of it to go around. And if we have the attitude, my little bit isn't going to matter. Uh, everybody's going to have a big difference versus if everybody does a little bit of their plays their part, then we're going to make a huge difference on sustainability. So uh, every little bit counts and, and how you achieve that is going to matter at the end of the day for the whole world. And am I correct that that Big Kaiser there in Hoffman Estates has taken some steps in around your shop? Yeah, we've you know uh, we've got the high cost lighting, uh, which helps on our energy bills, and and we've got the fans, the the big ass fans running through our warehouses and shop, so that we can uh, reduce our costs on on air conditioning and heat. Um, and they are uh, just like the tool holders; they cost a lot of money. It's something you probably don't have to have, but at the, you know, the end of the first year, you're going to see a huge payback on your energy bills. So yes, if you're not using any of these kind of green initiative things, such as lighting and, and airs, air handlers and things like that, please, you want to take a good look at them. Mm -hmm. Tim, I see you nodding your head in agreement over there. I, I oh, it just goes up you've taken. Yeah. It's just like, it's the same thing as standardization. You, you know, you, you take it to the, the, the building too, your facility. I mean, it's the same thing. It got good lighting, good expensive lighting. It saves you money. Uh, good airflow saves you on your heating and cooling. You standardize your maintenance on your machine, on your uh, AC, HVACs on a regular basis. All that stuff saves you money. And it really does. It's, it's pretty amazing how uh, you can see it really come together over a period of time. Yeah. And we, our guest in, in an upcoming segment of this program is uh, a gentleman that directs the Better Plants program at the Department of Energy. And it's all about how to do those things and what kind of incentives are out there waiting for people, either nationally or locally. So very good points. Um, gentlemen, we're about out of time. Jack, any closing thoughts before we sign off? No, I appreciate the time. And uh Certainly, Tim, I'm really grateful that you uh, took some time out of your busy day to join us today and, and give us a little bit of a user perspective to, to qualify a little bit about what we're talking here. Thanks again. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Appreciate it. Terrific. Well, thank you both. We appreciate you taking time out. I know how busy things are. And to our folks at home, we do this series every Monday at 1130 a.m. Chicago time, Central time. 
and we'll be bringing on different aspects. I, I talked about Department of Energy coming up. Today, we're in the tooling and the recycling. We have coolants, we have air quality. So everything related to sustainable manufacturing, we want to present through this conference series. So we appreciate you making time out. My name is Bill Herman for IMTS Spark. Thank you for joining us.